What we did is actually we tried to look at the phenotype and and look at the gen at the genotype that's related to the phenotype. And one of the things that came up almost immediately, but on the 10 first centenarians, and then again in the next 20 centenarians, is that those families have very high HDL cholesterol. Now, HDL cholesterol levels in men are average 45 and in women are average 55. And I'm talking about people who had above 100 up to 150 HDL cholesterol. So it was a really important markers. And we started to look for uh, genotypes associated with HDL cholesterol. And we found two genotypes that were very interesting. One is a CTP uh, genotype, and one is an APOC3 genotype. And I don't know if you want me to go through biology, but the more important thing is that a genotype, and that's why genetic research is so important now, a pharmaceuticals want to have a proof of concept in humans because they before they develop any drug. They want to find the humans who have mutation that makes a disease or mutation that prevents a disease. And CTP, targeting CTP was very important for companies. Pfizer started it, but then Merck, Pfizer developed a, a terrible drug. Okay, it wasn't the pathway, it's the drug that wasn't good. But Merck developed a drug that was much better and they came and wanted to see the data because if their CTP inhibitor is doing what our genetic is doing, then they, it's a great safety signal because those centenarians had 100 years <laughs> of inhibition of CTP, okay? And so, so you, can, you can cross that off your worries. And the same happened with the APOC3 genotype with two papers, one from Amish population and one from us. The first was from us to say that people with this mutation had high HDL, low triglycerides, and, and their highest high per percentage of them in centenarians. Not, not all centenarians had CTP, but it yeah. went from like four to 8% to uh, 15 to 20%. So when you have a, a genotype that kind of survives in centenarian, you kind of assume that it's a longevity genotype. So that's what happened. So they developed drugs and had phase three trials and those drugs have been really effective so uh, it just shows you there there's a way a direct way to go from genetics where you find the mechanism to developing drug and it's also you know when people are saying oh centenarians but i'm not a centenarian well that's exactly the point the centenarians don't need that but we can develop drugs yeah. so you can have a drug and they said you mean not a genetic fix we don't need uh, to have a genetic intervention no mo most of our genetic finding can be targeted by drugs so CTP is a cholesterol ester transfer protein, okay? So it basically takes the cholesterol and move it, okay? Eventually moves it out of the body, into the bile, out of the body. And as I said, the CTP is inhibiting this process. And what happens, this cholesterol is stuck on HDL that's becoming bigger and bigger, okay? So on one hand, we're doing something not so good or balancing something not so good. We're stopping the cholesterol from going out. On the other hand, we're building this HDL that might have an importance as a molecule to protect, you know, coronaries, endothelial things, and maybe other cells. But I don't know, you know, I, I was careful to say that we were looking for biomarkers um, or I said phenotype, maybe I meant, I meant biomarkers, an example. And I don't know if the HD, it's the HDL or the fact that all the lipoprotein are large. Okay. So the LDL is large also. And small LDL is one that we certainly know uh, induces coronary disease. So maybe it's not about HDL. Maybe it's only about large LDL cholesterol. Okay. So I, but by looking at this study, we see associations and I cannot tell you mechanism. In fact, the mechanism is very, very confusing because I have somehow to balance two things. I cannot stop totally uh, CTP but 
having a large HDL and the other size are, are okay. So that's just an example. You know, high HDL is associated with less coronary disease, but what was more important in our study, it was much more strongly associated with cognitive function. People with the highest HDL, people with a CTP mutation had the best cognitive function. Uh, so, so we might be missing other actions of, of this HDL. And when Merck did the study, I suggested that they use the opportunity to do cognitive tests. And they did cognitive tests, but they did cognitive tests on people over the age of 50. You don't see those things, you know, between 50 and 70. You have to have an older population in order to see effect on cognition. So I think in a way it was a missed opportunity and, and maybe it could have been different. So the HDL, this is how I'm using the HDL. If somebody comes to me and says, my uh, grandmother or mother, you know, father is a centenarian, I would ask them, what's your HDL? And if their HDL is high, I would say, I think you're very likely, the bad news for you, you're very likely to be very old. We're doing, we're doing other biomarkers uh, in our study. So for example, and my favorite is uh, we did by Optimer technology, it's, it's a new technology, 5,000 proteins in thousand of our subjects. Half of them were children of centenarians and half of them were controlled. And the nice thing with uh, proteins so, so we, we, we have very good clocks for methylation to, to, to do our, our biological age. But methylation is kind of stable. Um, and what, what we want is not only a biomarker that tells you your biological age, we want a biomarker that will change when you're giving a gerotherapeutics. Okay, that's what's the important for us. And I think the proteins are much more likely to change. For example, some of our proteins are proteins that are reflecting a breakdown. It's plasma proteins, but they're reflecting breakdown. Extra, extra matrix, collagen, degranulation of white cells or thrombocytes. And I think however you target aging, you have to stop this breakdown. So I think those proteins are going to be maybe better biomarkers than others. Um, by the way, in everything, in the genetics, as well as in the proteomic, things that are related to the growth hormone IGF uh, pathway are also changing a lot <laughs> in, in our subject between 65 and, and 95. So uh, there's, there's a lot to that. So, th so the biomarkers, we're, we're doing omics now and we're measuring biomarkers from different points of view, from methylation, from histone deacetylation, from protein, from metabolomics in order to find what are the sets that are going to predict not only your age, but will change when you are intervening.